Hello, it is once again I, Pykiss Chris. And it is yet again Bastard Swordsman. And welcome to another episode of Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. Burn. Uh, Yeah. Today we're going to be looking at uh, Spider-Man One More Day and uh, tearing into Joe Quesada for that just horrible, horrible writing decision. Um, unfortunately, I mean, I, very unprofessional of me, but I haven't read the comic, so... Um, it's okay. Do we have any alternate, like, contingency plans? Let me let you in on a little secret here. I haven't read the comic either. I have taste. Well, how do you know it's bad if you haven't read it? Sometimes you can just infer things, you know? In in all seriousness, I did read it, but it was, like, really long ago. Uh, I, I, I tried to, like, edit most of that shit out of my mind. Anyways, we're not atop the fourth wall. We are scenes from a podcast, and we don't talk about comics... We talk about movies. I love movies. Movies are my life. Man, I I just I just fucking love movies so much. Like I love uh the Marvel, the Star War. The the... Zack Snyder? Yeah. Zack Snyder is uh he has made films to rival citizen kane throughout he is a god amongst men throughout his entire career you know the the dawn of the dead remake that's one of my favorites it's actually real talk i've seen the dawn of the dead remake it was a long time ago um it's probably his best film which isn't saying a lot but yeah Oh my god. Yeah, I I forget uh Dawn of the Dead. That's like so like the original is all about like is all about how trying to like preserve like decrepit outdated power structures are bad and he's like no America Okay, Twitter. No, it's it's just a bunch of guys in a mall, and it's about consumerism. And it's like, wow, this looks no different than how it did before the zombie apocalypse. Because they're just, like, wandering brainlessly from store to store. And also consuming things, just not materials, but human flesh. Yeah, wake up, sheeple. And that's basically it. Yeah. Yeah. I try to avoid anyway. Zack Snyder as much as I can. Well, I mean, I'm talking about the original film. Oh, you are? That, yeah, that's what the original film is about. Okay, then. And the remake also takes place in the mall. Yeah. <sighs> it's just gorier, and there's, like, more over-the-top violence. But, yeah. It's like, it's before Zack Snyder got really pretentious, um, from what I remember. Although the uh, film ends with uh, Down With The Sickness by Disturbed. (laughs) (laughs) I'm sorry, that's just really funny. Um, yeah, uh, do you just, uh, want to talk about a film that's better than the Dawn of the Dead remake? Uh, I guess. I don't think either of us have, uh, anything better to talk about. So, uh, 
without further ado, uh, today's, today's, um, film, I forgot what the word for film was for a second, is, uh, it was Howl's Moving Castle, uh, by Studio Ghibli. Mr. I, Miyazaki. You, you didn't, you didn't even attempt to say his actual name, the director's name. I, I just said Miyazaki. You said Studio Ghibli. I said, I said Studio Ghibli, and then I said Miyazaki. No, I didn't even wait for you to say that. Yeah. I just maybe you should have more patience, man. Anyways, I'm sorry for not being respectful to my friend. Uh, anyways, uh, this is uh, one of his more famous films. Uh, this is, uh, I mean, in general, his films are pretty well known in the West, but this is like the one that, like, even people who don't know. What Studio Ghibli they know about this film. Uh, it's basically, it's, it takes place in this sort of soft, world-built sort of fantasy land uh, where witches and magic exist, and, um, you know, there's, there's all of these rumors about witches and, and sorcerers, and this one witch in particular, uh, Howl, you know, everyone thinks he, he's this wizard. Um, yeah, he's a wizard who, who eats young girls' hearts, and uh, our protagonist, uh, a young girl, uh, I can't remember her name. Uh, she gets, Sophie. She, yes, Sophie. Thank you. She gets caught up in one of Howell's antics when he, uh, when he shows up to her town one day, and because of that. The uh, Witch of the Wastes, who has a vendetta against him, curses her with old age, and she sets out on this journey to find Howl so that he can reverse the curse. And uh, from there, one thing leads to another, and... Yeah. Uh, this is one of... This, this is a film, I'm gonna be honest. I think it's... Uh, plot elements are are very loose and, uh, um yeah i would agree with you and i don't think this is even one of hayao miyazaki's better movies i think this is one of his weaker ones um uh i would say the only ones that i think are weaker would be nausicaa of the valley of the wind and ponyo the rest of his films that I've seen, and I've seen most of them, I would say are better than this. Uh, not to say it's a bad film, but it just didn't leave a lasting impression on me. Like, of course, to list the positives, the animation is beautiful. Uh, there's no crappy CGI. Um, uh, well, I mean, there might be some CGI, but it doesn't look crappy. Uh, you know, there can be a lot going on at screen at once and it still looks good. It just, there's a lot of, you know, life to it. Um, and the soundtrack is really good too. If I remember correctly, uh, I'm just looking it up right now who the composer was. Um, yeah, the composer was Joe Hisaishi who also composed Hana B, the first film we ever talked about on this podcast. And yeah, he's a pretty awesome composer. And there's this uh there's this one like recurring light motif which I think represents like Sophia and Howell's sort of relationship or just wonder in general. It uh, it appears over and over. I really like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think that it adds a lot of personality to a film that I feel like, ironically, doesn't have much personality. I'm going like, to be more... Oh, continue. No, you yeah, you can go ahead. I mean, I'm, I'm going to be more generous. Uh, I didn't... I never really saw this film before. This was like a, like a first viewing. I did see Poigno... I did see Spirited Away. Uh, so, 
I would say, yeah, obviously, Spirited Away is the better film. With that said, uh, I think this is, like, one of those films where it's, like, charm, wonder, and escapism were, like, were, like, kind of, yeah. the, like, the, the, the focal point. That's, like, I, I think Miyazaki was more so focused on evoking emotion than he was, like, with storytelling. Yeah, uh, it's more about like the feelings of the scenes, but yeah. I don't know. My problem is just that there's not really a lot built up like to those moments for me to really feel much. I mean, I mean, there are definitely some scenes that I think are well um, executed, but yeah. Uh, I will say... Um... As loose as the plot was, I I still was able to follow it, you know. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's um, probably because it is very simple, but also it's like there there there's a lot of stuff going on in the background, a lot of world building, you know, about like uh, witches and wizards and you know magic. They all sort of exist in this world and there there's this mistrust around them and superstition around them you know from normal folk who don't want to be cursed or whatnot but they all but there's also sort of like they they sort of swear fidelity to the king to the crown and fidelity yeah no it's you meant fealty fealty yeah oh okay uh and and you know they the king has like his own sort of grand uh sorceress you know at his side to sort of keep them all in check and sort of who has power to operate on her own uh you know it's there's a lot going on there it's and also this like civil war not civil war just 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 like a straight up war between two countries uh it's really easy to follow, you know. Uh, there's this really fun detail, spoilers, where you can hear some, like, soldiers in the background of, like, one of the scenes talking about, like, oh, this prince has gone missing. And, and at the time, it just seems like, you know, that's just the excuse for, like, the war to start. Because yeah. otherwise, the war really has no impact on, like, the story of the characters or anything. But at the end, uh, we find out that this sort of scarecrow uh, stalker guy was, <laughs> <laughs> he basically is a stalker. Uh, he was uh, cursed to be that scarecrow. He was the prince the whole time. And there's this sort of subtle implication that the uh, the grand sorceress was the one who put the spell on him because she wanted to start the war so that she could have an excuse to like summon Howl back to her side, you know? It's not stated out right, but I thought that that was like a really clever little bit of world and character building there. That was a funny scene where at the end of the film you find out that um the scarecrow is like a human like, you know, a sort of like cursed frog type thing. Yeah. Um and then she just kisses him, and then he's like, oh, I'm a human. Oh, I'm in love with you. And then she's just like, oh, uh, sorry, I'm in love with Howell. And he just gets cucked. <laughs> you really think he would have been able to pick up on the social cues. You know? Um, okay, so you um implied something um when you mentioned that you, uh, you know, heard, like, characters in the background just speak. Yeah. Um, I did not, uh, I watched this in Japanese. You did not. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, I saw, I saw the English dub, uh, with all of the, uh, with all of the English celebrity voice actors, you know, Billy Crystal as Calcifer and... Sigma uh, grind sets Christian Bale as Howell. Uh, I was not able to find a original Japanese version of this, unfortunately. 
Mm, but uh, um, so I'm assuming there are some major like plot deviations between the two. Well, no, 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 not really. All right. That I mean, no, that's not really how it works. Unless there's a massive tr like translation error to the point of it being like a fuck up. Yeah. I mean, it's the same film, just a different voice track. Uh. I will say, um. I'm I'm going to assume you know that just because it's the ori the original language and you know it can sort of capture the nuances of the script a little bit better but not even that but also because like it can just go at its its natural speed and tempo without having to lip sync that the the uh, japanese yeah, that's a good point. the japanese is like the superior version uh i still think the english dub is like really good you know it's like leagues ahead better than like most like english dubs of like japanese television shows and you know as as it should be this is like a a motion picture but like there's there's a lot of money behind this not just in the celebrities but also in like voice direction and you know very i mean i guess yeah. you you can continue uh very rarely did i think that there were like points where like the the delivery of the lines were awkward and uh it actually took me like a bit to realize that like bale was the one voicing howl uh i know apparently there are people out there who don't who think his voice is too deep for the character i thought it was it it was it was fitting he's that sort of soft spoken charismatic guy you know, you know, good with the ladies. It it fit to me, you know. In uh, the Japanese, uh, the original Japanese version, he's voiced by Takuya Kimura, who's like a big idol, and he was also he also played the main character of um, Judge Eyes, the video game, which is like a spinoff of the Yakuza series. Um, so, you know, and I actually only watched this for the first time, like, a few years ago, and that was after I played Judge Eyes, so, you know, I had to watch it in Japanese for Takuya Kimura, but also, I don't know, I heard, like, a little bit of the d dub, and, uh, I wasn't a fan of it. I guess to me, it's because I'm, like, I'm, like, comparing it, not even to just, like, modern English dubs, but, like, you know the 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 whole history of english dubs is like <laughs> it's like you you sent me a while back that um that breaking bad meme where, oh yeah where that's they, a really good one yeah where they talk like like english dub like uh, yeah asshole. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It's like, this is really good voice acting, and it's just, like, over-the-top, awkward pause shit like that. It doesn't sound like that, so it's like... And, and the, the one guy sounds like he's trying to voice the Joker. Yeah. <laughs> like the one background character. Yeah. Turned into the Joker there for a bit. Uh, the only The only voice I found very distracting was Billy Crystal. Uh... And that's just because that's, he has he has a that's big, in the snippet that I decided to listen to the dub and yeah, I was like, wow, this sounds bad. But yeah. in general, I think Calcifer is kind of an annoying character. Yeah. I mean, he's he's not the worst thing ever. It's just that like he has a very recognizable voice. And he's not he's not like a this is gonna sound mean. I don't think he's like a character actor like like Bale is. You know, he's 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 a comedian. So 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 it stands out more and and you're you're constantly distracted because you you're hearing Mike Wazowski come out of this little fire starter. 
Yeah. Um, it's really weird that uh Sophie basically just breaks into Howell's house and he's like fine with it. He's just like, oh well, whatever. I do. It does sort of follow the logic of the of the world though, where it's like he's he's not like a guy who's like caught off guard a lot there's a mild curiosity as to who this person is and what they're doing here and he might send some like aurora about her that that she or aura. aura about her aurora borealis no um you know i i just i just think it like the the scene where they meet again face to face is is handled really well because you get the sense that he he's he sort of knows more than he's letting on you know it's uh he's he's kept very mysterious throughout uh the the course of the film i don't, I don't, yeah. I don't know if i agree with that necessarily he's just standoffish I mean, I I sort of read it that way. I do think though that that it becomes like a, a problem, like once you get to the midway point of the film, where it's like, it's like I can see how she could become infatuated with him, you know. But it, like to say that she fell in love with him, that this is now suddenly a love story, uh. I don't know, they, they just didn't have enough meaningful interaction for that to, like, for me to really gel with that, you know? Yeah. Uh, I kind of, um, if, if it was interesting, though, probably the most interesting part of the film to me was how, um, her, like, old age spell, like, doesn't, like, immediately get broken and she goes, like, to, uh, being, like, from re being really old to being really young, but there are like moments where she looks like a little bit younger, and then moments where she looks like even younger than that. Um, but it was like at different points in the film, and I don't know what I got from that is like that it, it's usually when she's having like intimate moments with um Howell, um, and I would assume it's having. It, is basically saying that like love is the essence of youth or whatever. I sort of got the sense that the uh the film is is saying that like so the more confident she is, the more she believes in herself, the more uh the more she like breaks the curse on her somehow. I mean, yeah. And and the more she falls in love with Howell, the more she's she sort of gets inner strength because she has to like protect him and stuff like that. Um well I think that's a good idea. I think it could have been explained more, and I think it would have been a lot stronger again if if more time was like dedicated to like them forming a relationship. Yeah. Uh, it's still it's still a, like a, a miles better love story than than Ponyo at least. So there's that. Um, uh, I don't even really remember that. Like, from what I what I can remember, it's like it's like the 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 whole like the the whole thing is it's like you got to fall in love with this person or else the world will be drowned in the ocean oh, yeah and it's like mm. that's super romantic very you know it's like of course i'm going to say i love you otherwise the world's going to fucking end mhm mm yeah yeah, uh, I, uh, no, I don't care for Ponyo. Yeah. Um. Damn. Uh.
Um, it it does have some of uh, Miyazaki's typical topics of environmentalism and anti-war messaging. Um, you know, basically, like, these people who are engaging in war are literally becoming beasts. It's a bit on the nose. Yeah. I know that this this film is based off of a book. Uh, I'm fairly certain all of the stuff with the war and and the uh the the wizards who are like soldiers in it uh was was added by Miyazaki. Uh I mean it makes sense because it doesn't really fit with the main plot like yeah very much. Uh hmm. It's kind of weird how like the witch of the waste like curses Sophie and then she just like tags along with them and then they're all friendly. I, I thought that was a bit weird. Uh I'm sort of 50/50 on it. My big thing is that like after after she's like aged up, the the witch of the the waste um there's she there's there's like a scene later on in the film where she's where she's also cursed with old age because her magic is drained uh it's not like cursed it's that was her actual age and she was like uh appearing younger with magic oh, oh yeah yeah okay i uh, forgot but um where it's like so she joins up with them and moves in but it's like the film is really inconsistent about how senile she actually is because in some scenes she's like doesn't seem to remember uh beyond like base emotional stuff uh any of the the other people but then other times she's like very lucid and is like giving you know, and it, and is analyzing Sophie's character and like deducting how she feels, and it's like it's very convenient to the plot just how just how there she actually is, you know. Because there's like this. I mean, you could say that that's her like playing dumb or whatever. I guess, but it's but it's also like there's also like a clear change in her personality too, where she becomes a lot nicer after the fact. That it's that it's like it's like I don't know. I I I feel like more could have been done. That they could have like made it like a bit more clear like how aware of the situation she actually is mm. yeah. uh, actually the more i think about it that might be that might have something to do with like a dub change maybe or was that the case in in the in the original japanese too Uh, probably. I mean, she just felt, like, a bit sort of weird. But not, like, really senile, but I don't know. Yeah. Um. Hmm. Damn, we're kind of already, like, sort of scrounging for things to say. It's yeah. not really a very complex film. Yeah, it's... It, it's it's more uh it's it's more of a, a again this is this is a film that's that's more about like emotions and and sort of like you know a uh, a sense of wonderment it's not really it's it's not really on the the level of say uh castle in the sky or spirited away you know where it's yeah. <laughs> um. Where the where where sort of like 
you know, because even the the whole like war thing that was added to this story is very underplayed. And um, there's like a few scenes mm -hmm. where where it gets like a little dark, but um, and it's sort of downplayed with like this like triumphant. Oh, we'll bring down the the planes bombing the fields sort of vibe. Uh, where it, where it becomes more of a, more of like an adventure thing than it is about like the the horrors of war and whatnot. Mm -hmm. uh, I th I thought it was really weird, um, how. How Sophie's mother comes back like right before the climax and her her like thing is like I'm gonna give the the spy bug to them on behalf of like the king's sorceress and then she never shows up in the film again yeah what a shitty character yeah <laughs> very um that was weird. Don't don't trust your mom because she can betray you. We're gonna be pulling out some receipts on Sophie's mom soon. Uh, uh all of the gaslighting and verbal abuse, not to mention financial fraud. Can you believe okay, this? Okay, Zoomer. Yeah. Uh anyways. Um, I will say, um, as much, uh, much problems I have with like some elements of this story, uh, I really do think the animation carries it, not just the, 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 the whole meme of like, wow, Miyazaki is, you, you know, like, th there's just like this, this... Go. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's just like this way that like, the 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 things move in this world <laughs> you know um sort of sort of like the the preppy bounciness of the scarecrow uh to like the 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 kind of liquidy sort of shape-shifting form of like the the familiars and the and whatnot you know it's just really like it's just like really fascinating to look at, you know, and I and I think it sort of helps carry the film because again, the, the focus is on, you know, enhanced emotions and, you know, it's animation, you know, you, you can sort of milk that for all it's worth in, in a way that like script or, or dialogue you know, sort of compensate for the weaknesses you find in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, do you have any final thoughts, Mr. Swordsman? Uh, I don't know. I think the film is all right. Um, even though I might've been a bit hard on it. Uh, you know, it looks very pretty. It's, it's not an unpleasant film. Um, it's very, youthful and joyous uh like i like the soundtrack um yeah but eh, i don't know again the story like that that's sort of the, just the problem with it there's just not a lot to say about it it's not very complex and not that that's always a bad thing but i don't know it's just difficult like, to talk about it at length yeah you know uh not my favorite miyazaki film that would still probably be spirited away just because you know i haven't seen it in a my while but what my favorite miyazaki film is probably um either princess mononoke or Porco Rosso, which is a really hot take, but I really like that one. Yeah. Um, although I don't even think Miyazaki is the best uh, Ghibli director, and that's a real hot take. I think uh, it's Isao his son. Takahata. 
No, no, it is not. No, it is not. <laughs> I've yeah. I've seen a couple of um, what? Yeah, Goro Miyazaki's movies, and they are they are not good. Um, I can see why he. <laughs> um, uh, no, I, I'm not gonna say that. I was going, but yeah, he. Hayao Miyazaki always talks such shit about his son, and it's like really <laughs> painful to watch. He's not he's not a real man, you know, because he made bad movie. So true. Yeah. Um No, I um and yeah, in part ironically part of the problem is that Goro Miyazaki um tries to like imitate his father too much instead of doing his own thing. But no, what I was going to say is that the best Ghibli director in my opinion is a uh, Isao Takahata, who did uh, uh, Grave of the Fireflies, and he did some other films that I really like. Uh, not like to shit on Miyazaki or anything. He's obviously very talented, but I think people really just, like, idolize him and see him as just, like, oh, the best of the best. Like, no director can compete, and I don't really agree with that, but... Yeah, I think the film's all right. I'd give it like a six. I'd probably give it. Yeah, yeah, also a six. Um. Uh, really, not much to to say about it. It's really good at what it's trying to do, but um, we know that like, you know, he, this. The studio that made this, uh, Miyazaki and all of the other people who worked on this are, they, they can make better, bigger and better things and more thematically rich too. Uh, this one just sort of coats by on, you know, I don't want to say shallow emotions, but certainly, um, emotions i'm gonna stop before i yeah break my brain uh yeah i would recommend seeing this well well no i wouldn't go out of my way to see this i would but like if like a friend is like dude we should watch this it's you're not gonna like leave i'd be house. like yeah sure I, i'm not gonna say turn no nah, turn that shit off yeah you're you're not gonna like come out of this being like, well, that was a pile of bullshit. You know, it's not a Zack Snyder film. I mean, somebody might say that, but I wouldn't go that far. Yeah. See, I brought it full circle with the Zack Snyder thing. Kind of obsessed with Zack Snyder. Yeah. I'm obsessed with him in the same way that uh, Ahab is obsessed with Moby Dick. So, uh, take a Take that statement any way you want. Hmm. Yeah. So what you're saying is that you're obsessed with another man's dick. Yeah. Uh, yeah, probably, you know. Let's not dwell on that. Um, yeah, yeah, anyway. Um, should I get into my choice for the next episode? Why I think you should. Okay. Um. Well, I'm actually debating between two films, and I want you to uh, pick. But okay, so we're recording this episode right in the middle of October, which is of course the spooky month. Um. And so for. Next episode, which we'll be re uh, recording most likely at the end of October, near uh, close to Halloween, I wanted to recommend a horror film, and I was torn between two options. So, do you want to watch a Polish film from 1981 with Sam Neill, or a Japanese film from 1997? Uh...
Well, I did try Polish food earlier, uh, like a couple weeks back, so let's try some Polish film, too. Okay. The film isn't actually in Polish. It's in English, but um, it's from a Polish director. It's called Possession from 1981, and it's directed by Andrzej Zulowski. All right. Yeah, then that'll be my pick. All right. So we're we're gonna go get ready to be possessed. Uh, I'll summon my grimoires. I'm hoping to get me some Beelzebub, and uh, we will get back to you hopefully uh, around Halloween, maybe a little later. For uh, yeah, it's fine. For a little spooky, spooky. So uh, uh, boo. Ah! Oh, all right, I'm gonna go now. Goodbye. Bye.